Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. I just, got, I just uh, landed. I was in Portland this weekend for the Sabil conference there. And it was a big success. Hundreds of people, lots of great speakers. It was two days packed with great information and a lot of inspiration. Um, but for me, probably the most encouraging thing is to see so many people, hundreds of people who are there this weekend, all of you here today, thousands of others that I see all around the country and in other countries, who really have absolutely no reason in the world to spend their time and effort and money on this issue, yet care enough to do so. And this is precisely why um, I think this effort to bring about freedom and justice to Palestine is succeeding and will succeed. Uh, and I think much sooner than most people think. So when, when this does happen, when there is a freedom and justice in Palestine, all of us will be able to, I think, proudly tell our children and our grandchildren where we stood on this issue. Because we will be asked. You know, there's certain things, certain issues just, just define certain periods. It's just the way it is. I think the 60s, it was Vietnam and the civil rights here in America. The 80s was apartheid in South Africa. Now it's Palestine, obviously, and clearly. Um, and to see so many people who care so deeply and again, who have absolutely no reason in the world uh, to do so, is very, very encouraging. And this is exactly why I think uh, it's going to be successful. How many, how many people here have been to Israel-Palestine? Can I see a show of hands? OK, great. Yeah, thank you. Is anybody here from there? Nobody from there. OK, good. Um, and uh, so, so, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm um, very optimistic. I think this is. Uh, this is a movement, this is a, an effort that is going in the right direction over the last, I mean, all of us, there are many speakers at this conference in Sabil, and all of us agreed that over the last year or so, there's been a huge change, a, a, a quantum leap in terms of awareness, in terms of the level of the uh, conversation here in this country on this issue. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the great work that organizations like Sabil and other church organizations or church-based organizations are doing around the country, and the work that is done on campuses, young students who are doing tremendous work to get the, the voice of justice for Palestine out there uh, in campuses all across the country. They're doing just tremendous, tremendous work. So we've got very young people doing it. We've got people who have been around, and this is probably not their first, their first effort at activism doing it, um, which is very, very nice. And like I said, the, the, the voice of the Palestinian cause and the level of the conversation and the level of the debate is unprecedented here in this country. And it's come to a point where it's reached, the, you know, for the longest time it was below the radar. Now it's hit the radar. And so at the AIPAC offices in Washington, D.C., they're worried about what's going on. In Jerusalem, at the prime minister's office, they're worried about what's going on um, because they're realizing that they're losing. They realize that they're losing, and of course, that's a good thing. Um, now, certainly, I think we all know this issue is covered in so many layers of myth and so many different stories and versions of the stories that sometimes it's hard to, it's hard to really know where to begin. Um, and I think it's important to dispel some of these myths as quickly as possible. For example, one of them has to do with the fact that criticizing or the, or the, or the claim that criticizing Israel is somehow anti-Semitic. And I know many non-Jews have heard this from their Jewish friends or others, that when you criticize Israel, that's anti-Semitic. And this is a claim that comes down, that has been, or pushed down, I should say, all the way from, again, the prime minister's office in Jerusalem, um, and is being perpetuated. And I think it's an, an interesting claim, and I think it's worth examining. Because anti-Semitism is a form of racism. So if you criticize the state of Israel, how is it exactly racist, and how is it exactly anti-Semitic? Well, to begin with, Israel claims to be a Jewish state, but I don't think there's anything Jewish about Zionism or the Jewish state. Most Jewish people don't live there. Jewish people around the world have always, from the very beginning, either rejected 
completely the idea of, you know, the Zionist idea and the state of Israel or opposed it. Many Jewish people don't care one way or the other. Most of the people who do live in Israel are no longer Jewish. The majority there is Palestinian. And so you wonder, what is it about Israel that makes it Jewish and why is it anti-Semitic to oppose it? Is it somehow, is it somehow espousing Jewish values? Is having racist laws a Jewish value? Is imposing a brutal military regime a Jewish value? Is holding thousands of prisoners, political prisoners, a Jewish value? I don't think any of these things or any, any of the things that characterize the state of Israel have anything to do with anything that's Jewish. Besides that, if, you, if, if opposing this is anti-Semitic, what does it mean when you support that? What does it mean? What do you call somebody? What do you call yourself if you support a state that has thousands of political prisoners, an oppressive regime, racist laws, and denies water to people because they may or may not be Jewish? So supporting that is good, and opposing that is anti-Semitic? Does this even begin to make sense? But they throw that claim out there, they throw this argument out there in an effort to shut people up because nobody wants to be called anti-Semitic. I think the fact that this is what is being said only demonstrates that they have no other argument. They have no legitimate argument to support what they do. And so they talk about the Holocaust, they talk about anti-Semitism, they throw these things out there in order to insult. And we all know very well that when there's nothing to say, we, we, we revert to calling people names and, so, and that sort of thing. But that's not an argument. The other thing is, um, and, one, and one more of these many, many myths, is that somehow Israel is a, is, is a response to the Holocaust, to what Jews went through um, during World War II, which is an interesting claim. Um, or that somehow, the existence of the state of Israel is a guarantee that there won't be another Holocaust. Well, after World War II, after World War II was over, there were about two million Jewish refugees in internment camps in Europe. Less than 10% of those actually immigrated to Israel. The very Jewish people who suffered the most, the very Jewish people who you'd have thought would be the first ones to, to accept this idea, to espouse this idea, to support this idea of a Jewish state, weren't interested. They wanted to reclaim their identity as Europeans, as Belgians, or French, or whatever the case may be. Less than 10%. And many of those who did go, who did immigrate to Israel, left. Either because they were disgusted by the racism that they found, or because they were treated so poorly by the Zionists, that they couldn't stand it. Um, so once again, this whole claim, this claim that somehow Israel is either a response to or, or a guarantee against the, uh, another occurrence of the Holocaust is completely unfounded because Jewish people themselves spoke. They said, we're not interested. And when you think about it, how is, if we, if we oppose racism, any form of racism, including anti-Semitism, we would want to guarantee that there would be no racism at all. Not to take one small group and form another racist colonial estate somewhere else at somebody else's expense. How is doing that, how is doing that guaranteeing that there will be no more racism? So of course it's another one of those things that are thrown out there and of course nobody has the time and nobody bothers to check and realize that this has absolutely no serious claim whatsoever. So these are two of the many, many, many myths that are out there. People say, oh, those people over there have been killing each other forever. Oh, this problem is very complicated. Really? First of all, they haven't been killing each other for that long. Number two, it's not that complicated. Even in my lifetime, I'm 52, we've seen so many conflicts come to an end. We've seen so many racist regimes and oppressive regimes fall and come to an end. Why is this more complicated than the others? Why is this more complicated than apartheid in South Africa? Why is it more complicated than uh, dictatorships in Latin America? How is it more complicated? But when we say it's complicated, it's an attempt, or when they say it's complicated, it's an attempt to shut people down or shut people up. 
Because if it's complicated, that means we really can't, there's nothing we can do. But of course, everything, everything relies on us, on our willingness and our ability to do things. Now, people often talk about, or try to talk about this, um, you know, the peace process. And people are very disappointed and disillusioned every time the peace process doesn't succeed. And then they try again and it doesn't work. And they try again and it worked. And now they've tried again and it didn't work. And of course we get disappointed, but I think the reason people get disappointed is because they have false expectations. The peace process was not designed and has no chance whatsoever of solving the problem. It's trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. It creates this impression that we have an Israel and a Palestine. Two countries at war. And if that is the case, then yes, we need peace talks. But is that the case? Are Israel and Palestine two countries? They're not. Israel and Palestine are two names for the same country. The entire country is Israel. The entire country is Palestine. There are two nations living there, but there aren't two countries. There's one state, one army. So the issue here is not two nations at war. The issue here is an issue of an oppressive regime. And the solution is not, a peace, is not peace talks. The solution is a struggle to end this oppressive regime and replace this with a democracy. Very similar to what was done in South Africa, where apartheid regime had to be removed so that there would be democracy and so that the plight of people of color in South Africa would, would end. So obviously, the peace talks aren't going to lead to anything because they're going in the wrong direction. Even if they were well-intentioned, which I don't believe they are, I don't think they're well-intentioned, but even if they were, they're going in the wrong direction. We need a concerted effort to bring about justice and freedom to end the apartheid regime in Palestine, just like the struggle to end apartheid in South Africa. And then we will begin to see results. And then we have a chance at success, and a good chance at success, of success. Now, when did this all begin? How did the conflict begin? P people like to you know, throw all kinds of ideas. I think the, I, the, the, com the problems began when white Christians in Europe thought they had the right to take somebody, one person's country and give it to somebody else. So that was, you know, the British thought that they had a right to take people's countries, chop them up, give them away, do all kinds of things like that. And Israelis always, or the pro-Israeli groups always talk about the Balfour Declaration. And they talk about the Balfour Declaration as though this was Moses coming down from the mountain, as though he brought it with him. <laughs> what was the Balfour Declaration? Lord Balfour had a friend called Lord Rothschild who happened to be Jewish. And he said to him, you know what? We are going to give somebody else's country, Palestine, to the Jewish people for a homeland. Who is he to give Palestine to anyone? Why is this even, why is this even important? Of course, they had the power to do so, and they, and they did everything they could to accomplish it. But it's this interference, it's this colonial mentality, this racist, very racist, very colonial European mentality that says that we can do things like that. We can take brown people's country and give it to more white people. So there we have a problem. Now, later on, it became even more severe when the United Nations decided they had the right to partition Palestine. The Jews wanted some of it, the Arabs wanted some of it, so we'll partition, give these a little bit, these a little bit, and everything will be fine. And of course, we, the white Europeans, have the right to do this. Of course, it wasn't fine. First of all, on the 29th of November, 1947, when the partition resolution, this is the, this is the, this is the map, the partition of Palestine, the resolution to partition Palestine took place, there are only about half a million Jews living in Palestine. This was a generation of my grandparents who immigrated there, and my parents who were born there, first generation Israelis, if you will. Although my parents' birth certificate said Palestine. In fact, I have a picture of my father's first passport in the book, it says Palestine. So there are only about half a million uh, Jews. Now, the, pop, the Palestinian community in Palestine, the native community, numbered close to a million and a half. Yet somehow, when the United Nations decided on the partition plan, they gave the larger portion of the country to the smaller Jewish community. And to this day, people will say, you know, this is really all the Palestinians' fault because they rejected the partition plan. They should have accepted this? Anybody would have accepted something like this? 
But it said as though, see, they should have accepted it. This is all their fault. You hear this to this day. And what's interesting, another interesting thing about this particular day in history is that from, this, from that moment on, we have two histories that are completely di that are mi diametrically opposed. Two narratives that are completely different that begin on that day. Now, particularly in this country, but this is kind of the tendency, is to try to find some kind of a balance, to try to bridge the gap, to bring the stories closer. You can't bridge the gap when the histories are completely diametrically opposed. When you have two completely opposing stories, only one can be true. Now, the story that I was raised upon as an Israeli, and the story that I, I know people in America learn, and generally in the West, is that after the Arabs, because we don't say Palestinians, the Arabs rejected the partition plan, they began an assault on the Jewish community, intending to kill and destroy the small Jewish community in Palestine, or the land of Israel. The Jewish community fought hard, they were brave, they were a little bit more advanced, of course, because they were Europeans. They outsmarted the Arabs, and they were able to defeat them. Of course, being that they were the descendants of King David, who defeated Goliath. Yeah. And they were the descendants of the Maccabees, who defeated great empires. Once again, they came back. They defeated the Arabs. And for the first time, after 2,000 years, they established a homeland or a state for the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Now you tell me if this doesn't sound like another chapter from the Old Testament. <laughs> this is so heroic and so romantic, it's almost biblical. <clears throat> in my case, my father was an officer in the Zionist militia that fought. So this was even more heroic. Problem is, when we start to look at the details. So, like I said, in 1947, there were two communities there. Both communities were hoping to become states, although, of course, one was far smaller than the other. And we know that the Zionist community, the Jewish community in Palestine, invested in one particular thing that the Palestinians never did. And that made all the difference in the world. And that was an actual armed militia, a fighting force. By 1947, the Zionist militia numbered close to 40,000 well-armed, trained men. Very well-trained and very motivated. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. There was no armed militia on the Palestinian side. In fact, there's never been a Palestinian army. So you have to wonder if that's the case, who are these Arabs that attacked the Jews after this resolution was accepted? If there was no armed force, who attacked the Jews? We know later on, six, seven months later, other Arab armies intervened in Palestine. We also know that they were very easily defeated by the Zionist militia as well. But in 1947, when this began, who were these Arabs that attacked and what did they attack with? And over the last 20 years, Israeli historians have been validating what the Palestinians have said all along, which is it was the other way around. As soon as the United Nations accepted the resolution to create a Jewish state in Palestine, the Zionist militia initiated a massive attack that can only be categorized as terrorism and ethnic cleansing. It was a massive terrorist attack against the civilian population with a clear intention of completing the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Within 12 months, they were able to conquer almost 80% of the country, destroy hundreds and hundreds of cities and towns and villages, including churches and mosques and schools and homes and everything else, and establish the state of Israel. And somewhere between 800,000 and 1 million Palestinians were forced out of their homes and out of their country. So it's not such a romantic story. Perhaps it's not heroism at all. It's, it's more like terrorism. At the same time, the story, you know, the pieces fit the puzzle. Now, quite often we do hear that, well, perhaps a few Arabs were forced to leave, perhaps a few villages were destroyed, but there was nothing there. There was nothing there but sands and, and, and swamps and, and poor Bedouins. There was nothing there. Any progress that, that, that exists in Palestine was brought by the Zionists. So I'd like to show this picture of the city of Jaffa 
This is pre before 1948. The city of Jaffa sat on the coast of the Mediterranean. It was a major Arab city, close to 120,000 people, a rich political life, rich business life, trade unions, teachers unions, writers guilds. Several newspapers were printed in Jaffa. Movie theaters, concert halls, the biggest names in the Arab world would come to perform in Jaffa. Oranges. And, of course, the oranges, the Jaffa oranges, true. <laughs> And in a matter of two weeks in 1948, this city of close to 120,000 was reduced to less than 4,000 people concentrated in one neighborhood with barbed wires and Israeli guards surrounding them. And today, on the ruins of Jaffa, and in a picture that's almost exactly from the same angle, we have the city of Tel Aviv the modern Israeli city of Tel Aviv. There's still, Tel Aviv calls itself Tel Aviv Yafo. So there's a small little bit of Yafo that remained. There's also a small, oppressed, neglected Palestinian community still in Yafo, subject to terrorizing by Israeli, by Israeli, they're not exactly the army, the Mishmar Gvul, it's kind of an Israel, half army, half police. They're subject to Israeli oppressive racist laws. They're neglected because they are Arabs, and these are Israeli citizens. Now, the reason this is so important is not just that we know what happened, although this is one sample, but also to realize that we cannot reduce the question of Palestine into the West Bank and Gaza, which is what the peace talks try to do. Everybody, or many people, have the impression that the, when we say Palestine, it's the West Bank and Gaza, that the Palestinian problem is the West Bank and Gaza, that the occupation is the West Bank and Gaza. It's not true. The entire country is occupied Palestine. Palestinians live everywhere in Palestine. In the Galilee, in Jaffa, in Jerusalem, in the Nakab Desert. And they all are subject to, this, not the same, but very similar oppressive laws, neglect, racism, and discrimination. So you cannot reduce the question of Palestine just to the West Bank and Gaza. And it's also important to realize that the Palestinians who are citizens of the State of Israel are also subject to, to, to an oppressive regime, to an occupation. Because they have become, they've become aliens in their own land, in their own country. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard the term the Nakba. I'm going to grab some water. The term the Nakba, which is what Palestinians call the War of 1948 means a catastrophe. We Israelis call the Nakba, or the War of 1948, the War of Independence. And I remember when I first heard that Palestinians call the War of 1948 the catastrophe, I was personally insulted. How could anybody call such an important historic event, the revival of the Jewish people, a catastrophe? And I describe in my book my journey into Palestine and how I learned what the catastrophe was, what the Nakba was. Today I feel, however, that people misunderstand what the Nakba is. The Palestinian catastrophe didn't happen in 1948. It began in 1948. It continues to this day, and it gets worse and worse and worse every year. I took this picture to a refugee camp, Palestinian refugee camp, about a year ago. Over four million Palestinians living in refugee camps. As you can see in this picture, and this could be almost any refugee camp, there's no proper sewage system, there's no water, there's no electricity, there's no access to clean, well, no clean water, no access to proper nutrition, forget proper health care, perhaps forget opportunities to work and so forth. And this is happening sometimes 20 minutes, half an hour, maybe an hour drive from modern cities within Israel where you wouldn't even, you wouldn't dream of seeing Israeli children look like this. Not anywhere in Israel. And the reason these children have to live like this is because they're Palestinians and because they're prevented from returning to the very places from which their grandparents were forced to leave. This is not in some remote uh, mountaintop in, in Afghanistan. This could be 20 minutes from Jerusalem, Tel Aviv. Major Israeli cities, maybe an hour's drive. And this continues largely as a result of the vast amounts of money that is being sent to Israel by Americans. The tax dollars 
that we heard about earlier. The reason this can continue is because Israel is being bank is that the U.S. is bankrolling this. It's bankrolling the ongoing suffering and the catastrophe of the Palestinians. It's unjustifiable. It's inexcusable. It's happening under our watch every single day, every single day, including today. This is happening. Unjustifiable and inexcusable, and this has to stop. It absolutely has to be brought to an end. And we're the only one, people here are the only people that can do this. Now, um, my, my, my book is a memoir, so it talks a lot about my family because my family, well, first of all, it's my family, but also because it was, my family was very much involved with the creation of the State of Israel. Like you heard, my, my, my maternal grandfather was a Zionist leader. He was one of the signers of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. My father uh, was a general and so forth. And this is a picture of my mother when she was young. She's 87 years old today. I mean now. And now she was born and raised in Jerusalem. She still lives in Jerusalem. And I'm not talking about the old city of Jerusalem. I'm talking about the neighborhoods that were built outside of the old city and what later on became the Israeli side of uh, Jerusalem. And in that side of Jerusalem, there are many Palestinian neighborhoods. Very well-to-do, very beautiful neighborhoods with beautiful homes. In fact, the neighborhoods and the homes are still there. They're very distinct Jerusalemite Palestinian homes. And there's a story that my mother told me many, many times. In fact, we still talk about it. As I was growing up, she was t telling me the story uh, about something she experienced in 1948. When the Zionist forces came, they took the neighborhoods, took the homes, forced the Palestinians to leave. And these homes were made available to Israeli families. She was living, she was already a mother at the time. She was living in a small apartment with her parents. And she was offered one of these homes. And she refused. And the way she tells the story is always the same, with the same emotion. She said, how could I possibly take the home of another mother? How could I move into the home of another family which now has to live in exile? Now, and then she would go on to describe the looting, how the soldiers looted these homes. Because these are well-to-do homes, there were rugs and you know, furniture and so forth. Now, it's an excellent story. It's a story of, 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 ra of great moral courage. It's too bad that more people didn't do what she did. But there was something about the story that was troubling to me my entire life, almost, certainly as I was growing up. And it wasn't when I, until I was actually working on the book that I could reconcile what the problem was. She was contradicting the national narrative because she was presenting a moral dilemma in a narrative that has no moral dilemmas. It's morally perfect. You see, we, the Israelis, we the Jews, are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews who lived there some 3,000 years ago. Never mind, there's no historical evidence to that, but that's what we claim. <laughs> so this is our country because it's the land of Israel. Now we've returned, we deserve it all, and when the United Nations decided to give us just a part, we agreed. Because we're reasonable and we're tolerant and we're willing to compromise. So we agreed to accept the partition and then we were attacked by the Arabs. Thankfully, we won. We defeated the evil Arabs. And then, being gracious as we are, we asked them to stay and they left. <laughs> we asked the Arabs to stay and they left. So you have an empty home, and you have a family that needs a home. Where's the moral dilemma? There's no moral dilemma. Like I said, the Zionist narrative is morally perfect. Even when we talk about atrocities that took place in 1948, even when Israelis learn about atrocities, and we do, the massacre of Dir Yassin, you may have heard. Dir Yassin was a small village on the outskirts of Jerusalem. When the Zionist forces came, the village surrendered. The forces came in and massacred men, women, children, committed a terrible, terrible massacre there. And we learn about this. But as we learn about this as kids, and I remember this vividly, the end of the story is that Chaim Weizmann, who was an important Zionist leader, later the president of the state of Israel, said that while the massacre, of course, was a terrible thing, as a result of the massacre, thousands of Arabs fled. And that allowed us to establish a Jewish majority. And we all know, boys and girls, of course, that there's nothing more important than creating a Jewish majority. And that is the end of the story. 
So we come out, morally, we come out on top because something important and good happened. And it continues today. We bomb Gaza knowing full well we're killing innocent people, including children, but it's okay because Hamas is in, is in Gaza and they're terrorists, so it's okay. Morally, we're always fine. And like I said, as a child, she was presenting this moral dilemma that I could not reconcile until I was much, uh, much older. Now, this is what the map looked like uh, for the first 20 years or so. Between 1948 and 1967, Israel occupied almost all of Palestine with the exception of the West Bank and Gaza. And then 1967 rolled around. We heard that Israel was under an existential threat. Arab armies were getting ready to destroy the small state of Israel. Once again, thankfully, the, Arab, the Israeli forces were strong and more advanced and more developed and braver and so forth. And this time in six days, talk about biblical themes, in six days they were able to defeat the Arab armies and conquer all this land. And by then, my father was already a general. So that whole generation of young officers of 1948 were now the generals, part of the Israeli high command. And many of them later on said, and, and as I was looking at the Israeli army archives, working on my book, it was clear that they knew there was no, absolutely no threat to the state of Israel, certainly not an existential threat. They say it very clearly as, as you read the minutes of the meetings of the generals. But that's a whole other story. Um, in fact, what Israel did in 1967 is erase Palestine off the map completely and establish a single state over the entire country with exclusive rights for Jewish people. Now, the taking of the West Bank was not an accident. It was something that the military was expecting and hoping and planning to do since 1948. They, waited, they almost had to wait almost 20 years for, to do this. And the fact is that as soon as the West Bank was taken, hundreds of towns and villages, Palestinian towns and villages were destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forced into exile. And a massive building project for Israeli Jews began in the West Bank exactly what happened after 1948 in the rest of Palestine. In other words, the occupation of the West Bank is no different than the occupation of the rest of the country. The settlements, the cities and towns in the West Bank are no different than the cities and towns in other places. This was part of a plan to expand the state of Israel over the entire what they call land of Israel, and that's what they did. So this is important not only so that we know what happened, but also to see the absurdity of this notion of the two-state solution. There is no scenario where an Israeli government will permit another state to be established on the land of Israel. Ideologically, it's impossible, and politically, it'll never happen. One of the first orders given by the Israeli army after they took the West Bank was that the water in the West Bank belongs to the state of Israel. The West Bank, as you may know, has one of the largest water sources in the, in, in the whole country. Now, after the West Bank was taken, after the war was over, my father did something very interesting. He was a member of the Israeli High Command. And at the very first, the very first meeting of the Israeli High Command after the war, he stood up and he said, now we have an opportunity to solve the Palestinian problem. We conquered the land, we destroyed the armies, we're invincible, it's all true. At the same time, there's still another nation here. There's a huge Arab majority, a minority. Then there was still a minority. We should allow them to establish a state in the West Bank and Gaza, recognize their right to self-determination, and then this will, this will allow us to solve this problem. If we don't do this now, he said, we will become an occupation, uh, a foreign occupation. There will be resistance. We will be forced to fight that resistance. This will have horrendous moral uh, effects on the, on the very nature, on the very, on the very fiber of the Israeli society and the Israeli army. And eventually, we will become a binational state. Every single word that he said that day actually took place, actually happened. It was prophetic. Everything he said actually took place. But like I said, as he was saying these words, the Israeli bulldozers were already destroying Palestinian towns. Israeli army trucks were already expelling Palestinians across the river, across the Jordan River. 
and a massive building project, which they call settlements for some reason, but I mean, they're all settlements. Cities and towns and neighborhoods were being built for Israelis only in the West Bank. Now, this is, by the way, a picture of my father in uniform. Uh, now we hear that Israel wants peace, that Israel has always wanted peace, but there's no one to talk to. There is no partner. Every time we get close, the Palestinians do something to destroy it. So I think it's, it's, it might be worthwhile to examine this. My father retired a year after the war, and he dedicated the rest of his life really to pursuing and advocating this idea of recognizing Palestinian rights to self-determination in the West Bank and Gaza, and the rights of Palestinians who are Israeli citizens to equal rights. Two things that have never happened to this day, that Israel had never recognized. In the mid-1970s, he and a few other Israelis who, who uh, shared his views established an organization that was dedicated to this cause. And as soon as they announced the establishment of this organization, I remember it vividly, they were contacted by the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat's top aides, top people. They were contacted uh, by these people in order to begin a discussion, maybe, on how this might work out. Um, and they began to meet. They would meet in, European, in Europe, they'd meet in North Africa. It was all very secret in the beginning. On the Palestinian side, these were official delegates, official members, official representatives of the PLO. On the Israeli side, these were people like my father who were really renegades. I mean, they were well respected. They held high office at some point in their life, but now they were speaking on their own. They represented no one. They had no political power. But when they would return from these meetings, my father would always go and report back to the prime minister. He had that kind of access in those days still. So the Israeli government was kept fully abreast. They knew exactly what was going on, and they wanted nothing to do with it. They wanted no part of this. In 1983, this group, my father and the others, actually met with Yasser Arafat in Tunis. It was a highly publicized meeting. There was pictures and so forth. By the way, in this picture, my father is with uh, Isam Sartawi, who was uh, one of those Palestinian leaders. He was um, um, the Palestinian ambassador in, in Paris for many years. Anyway, they met with Arafat in 1993. Shortly after that, in a move that was initiated by Shimon Peres, of all people, the Knesset, the Israeli Knesset, passed a law that made these meetings illegal. These particular meetings between Israelis and the PLO, illegal. That's the 80s now. Suddenly, 1993 came around. And we had the Oslo Peace Accords. The peace process began. I'm sure many of you remember, it was September 1993, the White House lawn, Bill Clinton was there as president, Yasser Arafat, it's Hakker Bean, they shook hands, they signed the paper. And many people thought, many of us thought, this was really, this is really it. Of course, by 1993, the Soviet Union had fallen, the Berlin Wall fell, Apartheid in South Africa fell. In other words, all of these things that people said could never happen were happening. So it gave us reason to hope, to believe that this was, Palestine was next. What people didn't realize is that by 1993, there was no more possibility to establish a Palestinian state because there was no more West Bank. The West Bank was already fully integrated into Israel full of, they call them settlers as though they're different than other Israelis, but full of cities and towns and highways and industry and malls and everything else for Israelis only in the West Bank, just like there were in other parts of the country. There was no more West Bank. There was no more chance to create a Palestinian state in 1993. The purpose from the Israeli standpoint of Oslo was not to make peace. It was to bring the Palestinians to surrender to accept Israel dominance over the entire country and domination of the resources and the people. And because the Palestinians refused, because Yasser Arafat refused, there was no peace. There was no surrender. Oslo was supposed to bring to a final solution in five years. From 1993, that would have been 1998. In the year 2000, Bill Clinton tried to bring everybody together to Camp David to try to seal the deal. Of course, same thing happened. And then Yasser Arafat was blamed for not making concessions. Whereas, by agreeing to the two-state solution, which meant the full West Bank and Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem for a Palestinian state, which is about 20% of Palestine, he was agreeing to give up almost 80% of his home of, of Palestine and the right of the Palestinians to ever return, the millions of refugees to ever return. 
and he recognized the state and was willing to make peace with the very state that brought about this catastrophe and destroyed Palestine. And all of this, and he was blamed for not making concessions because he would go no farther. Israel was not interested in the Palestinian state in the West Bank. In fact, Israel was not interested in any state in the West Bank. The West Bank is part of Israel. In fact, in Israel, people don't say West Bank anymore. They say Judea and Samaria. The West Bank no longer exists. Yasser Arafat was, in fact, pro we could probably be characterized as the most consistent voice for peace for 30 years. Between the mid-1970s and the day he died in 2004, he was the most consistent voice for peace. He was, a, he was willing and he fought for peace based on the two-state solution, which he thought was fair. Israel was not interested. Wasn't interested, isn't interested, and will never be interested. It's a zero-sum game. It's an impossibility that a Zionist government, a Zionist state, will ever make peace with the Palestinians, which demands partition of the land. Now, there's one issue that I, I think is sorely missing from the conversation, and that is the issue of the Palestinian prisoners. Israel, for decades, has been holding thousands and thousands of Palestinian prisoners. Of course, Israel calls them terrorists and a security threat. But it turns out, and this is based largely on research done by Israelis, that the vast majority of the Palestinian prisoners held by Israel have never been charged with acts of violence. The vast majority of the Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails have never been charged with acts of violence. And this is by the standard of the Israeli military court, which judges, you know, Palestinians are held, are, are uh, always um, have to go to military court. It's military law that governs the life of Palestinians. According to Israeli military law, a kid with a rock is a terrorist. And the vast majority of, the thousand, of these thousands of prisoners were never at, charged with acts of violence, which means they are political prisoners. Besides the fact that the world and the international community recognizes the rights of people to resist. In fact, the UN resolution says that the struggle of people under colonial and alien domination and racist regimes three things that categorize the state of Israel almost by its own definition. The struggle against reg these regimes for the implementation of their right to self-determination and independence is legitimate and in full accordance with international law. People have the right to resist. The world recognizes this. My father was asked once after he was retired, you know, as a general, how could you possibly talk to terrorists? He said, well, terrorism, of course, is a terrible thing. At the same time, when a small nation is occupied by a larger power, quite often it's the only means at their disposal. And as we see, as is reflected by the prisoner population in Israeli jails, the vast majority of Palestinian resistance has always been unarmed. That's why the vast majority of the prisoners are not charged with acts of violence. These are the leaders of the resistance, and the vast majority of Palestinian resistance has always been unarmed. You can say Sabil is a form of resistance. And there are many, many other, other examples of that. So these are political prisoners. Uh, and of course, there are hundreds and hundreds of, of prisoners who are held in Israeli jails without being charged with anything at all. In other words, even by the low standard of the Israeli military court, there is nothing with which they could charge them. And still, they sit in jail for months and years, including women and children. And yet, Israel calls itself a democracy. And if you've been there, you know this. You, I don't think there's a family in the West Bank or Gaza that hasn't had somebody in jail. They say Palestinians are one of the most incarcerated, if not the most incarcerated people in the world. But not for crimes, you know, for resistance. That is legitimate and recognized by international law. And what the Israeli propaganda, the pro israeli propaganda does, of course, they take the, act, the, 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 the military uh, resistance, the military aspects of the resistance, and that is what is always highlighted. Although that is clearly the minority. That is clearly not how Palestinian resistance is categorized. 
Another aspect of my own personal story, as like you heard earlier, was the death of my, my sister's daughter, Smadar. She was killed. She was 13 years old. She was killed in a suicide attack in Jerusalem on the 4th of September, 1997. And as you can imagine, this is big news in Israel. Whenever there's an attack like this, it's, of course, big news. This time it was bigger news because here's the granddaughter of a famous Israeli general. Not only was he a general, but then he became an advocate for Palestinian rights. My father passed away two years before that. I was already living in the U.S. I took the first plane home. By the time I reached my sister's apartment in Jerusalem, the place was packed with people who came to express their sorrow, of course, both Palestinians and Israelis, but also with the press. Every news agency, every, every news uh, in every language, newspapers and media, and all forms of media were there from everywhere around the world. And the questions that are always asked are, first of all, who's responsible, and then how do we get them, and how do we make them pay, and how many of them do we get in response, and revenge, and so on. And when my sister Nareet came out, finally, after the funeral, to answer questions, she said, well, first of all, don't talk to me about revenge. She said, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. No real mother would want to see this kind of grief fall upon another mother. The idea that we kill people in response to somebody's death is absurd, it's sick. And then she quoted from a famous line from a famous poem by Bialika, he's a well-known Hebrew poet, who wrote that even the devil himself could not come up with a vengeance that's appropriate for the death of a child. And in terms of who's responsible, she said, well, let's take a look. Who is it that is taking away Palestinian land, destroying Palestinian homes, throwing Palestinian fathers and brothers in jail, shooting Palestinian children in the schools, depriving them of water, depriving them of rights? Who is doing all of this? It's the Israeli government that's doing all of this. And both she and her husband Rami said, clearly we hold the Israeli government directly responsible for our daughter's death. What do we expect? That we maintain a brutal regime like this? And there'll be no price to be paid? There'll be no innocent people killed? What do we expect? This is a direct result of that. So of course now this became even bigger news. Because here's an Israeli mother who just buried her daughter and she is turning the world upside down. We know that the Palestinians are the terrorists, the Israelis are victims. That Israelis want peace and Palestinians won't make concessions and she's turning it, turned everything upside down. And she's become an activist and you know, very uh, outspoken on this issue as her husband and her three other boys. In fact, she published a book, an excellent book about the Israeli education system and how racist it is. It's called Palestine and Israeli School Books. I highly recommend it because it gives you the background of what Israelis learn. In my case, I had to come back to the U.S., which is where I lived in San Diego, and you got to pick up and go. And how do you pick up and go after, after you see that small coffin going to the ground? It's not something you forget. But I was very, my, my good fortune was that in San Diego there was a, um, a Palestinian, a Jewish-Palestinian discussion group, a dialogue group, which I began to attend. Now, I was born and raised in Jerusalem. And if you've been there, you know, it's considered a, a mixed city, uh, you know. That was the first time I ever met Palestinians, was in San Diego. And, and the chapter in the book begins with a line, my journey into Palestine began in San Diego. I was 39 years old. And this is interesting, something that resonated when I was in South Africa. Jerusalem, although it is mixed, it is so segregated and so racist that Israelis don't meet Palestinians. So an Israeli growing up in Jerusalem, you don't meet Palestinians. You see them, but you don't meet them. Not only was it the first time I met Palestinians, but it was the first time that I was with Palestinians in the same place, and we were equal. In other words, we were completely equal under the law. That doesn't happen over there. There is no place in that country, Palestine, Israel, however you want to call it, both, where Israelis and Palestinians live under the same laws. Not in the West Bank, not in the Galilee, not in Jerusalem, not anywhere where Israelis and Palestinians live under the same law, are equal under the law. So this was a very, it was a powerful experience. It was, it was, a, it was a very significant experience to suddenly sit with Palestinians where they had no need for permits or curfews or anything, or checkpoints to go through. They needed no favors from me as an Israeli. And then I began to hear about the Nakba, about what happened in 1948. You know, it was a dialogue group. Everybody told their stories. 
And then I began to realize that there was this whole country that I never knew, even though I grew, was born and raised there. There were these whole people that I never met, even though they were next door to me. And there was this whole narrative that was completely opposite from the narrative I knew. And then I began to travel into Palestine, go to Palestinian cities and communities, and eventually realize this very painful realization that of the two opposing stories, the one that wasn't true was mine. And growing up with such strong Zionist heritage, to suddenly realize this, it wasn't sudden, but to realize this, is extremely painful. Extremely painful. Excruciating. Um, now, the question remains, where do we go from here? And I think it's an important question to discuss, and that's how the book ends as well. The reality today is that there is one state over the entire country of Israel-Palestine. It's a state with exclusive right for Jewish people. Like I said earlier, it's not a Jewish state. Most Jews don't live there. Most of the people who do live there are not Jewish. But it is a state that, has, that, that offers exclusive, that has exclusive rights for Jewish people. And I think it's important to realize that when people recognize or accept the Jewish state or the state of Israel, it's a package deal. It comes with thousands of political prisoners, racist laws, discrimination, oppression, and a brutal military regime that inflicts casualties on the other side, the non-Jewish side, on a regular basis. Israel has to maintain a certain level of violence all the time, and then of course it's very good at blaming the Palestinians for the violence, but Israel has to maintain a level of violence all the time to explain why there's no peace, and because they can blame it on the Palestinians, they get away with it. They say, well, Israel bombs Gaza because of Hamas. Israel's been bombing Gaza for 60 years. Hamas hasn't been there that long. But there was always something in Gaza that justified killing innocent civilians there. I would categorize the Israeli army today as nothing more than, than, than probably one of the best armed, best fed, best financed terrorist organizations in the world because its sole purpose is the terrorizing of Palestinian people. Israel, there are no military threats to Israel. There's a threat to the legitimacy of Israel, which cannot, Israel can't defend. Israel cannot defend its legitimacy because it, it is not legitimate, it's illegitimate. But there is no security threat. So accepting Israel, recognizing Israel is okay, but I think it's important to own that it's a package deal. Many people in this country and around the world supported apartheid in South Africa. In fact, it was very hard to get anybody in this country to oppose apartheid in South Africa in the beginning, and I'm sure many of you know this. Today, of course, the people who supported apartheid are either denying it or hiding in some corner, ashamed. And of course, when Nelson Mandela died, everybody, the outpour, everybody loved Nelson Mandela, of course. <laughs> nobody, 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 you know, ever called him a terrorist or was glad that he was in jail. But we know the truth. And this is the same thing. Anybody who decides that they support the state of Israel has to own the fact that they're supporting a racist, oppressive, brutal regime. And that's how it is. So don't be offended when we talk about this issue and it's divisive. Because on the issue of racism, is a divisive issue. You're either a racist or you're not. You can't say, well, we support Israel, but we are pro-human rights. Make up your mind. You can't do both. It's divisive, it's hurtful, it's not fair. It's not supposed to be fair. It's supposed to be divisive. It's important. You either support human rights and civil rights and equality, or you're a racist, and own it which is something they don't like to do. So that's the package deal, but it's not the only deal. It's not the only package. Like I said, even only in my lifetime we have seen fascist and racist regimes fall in, in Spain, in Greece, in Latin America, in, in so many different places, and of course in South Africa. Most of them were done without violence through a political process. And there's absolutely no question that through a political process, democracy and equal rights can come to Palestine as well. Zionism replaced apartheid today. Just like there was a struggle against end apartheid, there needs to be a struggle to end Zionism, because that is the problem. 
So people say, yes, you talk like you want, a, you want another genocide, you want another holocaust, you want to kill Jews. Nobody's killing anybody. I'm talking about including everyone and applying the same rights and the same benefits that Israeli Jews have to everybody else who lives there. Out of 12 million people that live there, 5.9 million are Israeli Jews. The rest are Palestinians. Now, Israeli and Palestinian societies are very similar societies. It's not like in South Africa where you had very few, very rich whites and millions of, of impoverished, uneducated people. Israeli and Palestinian societies are highly educated, large middle class, largely moderate, although they have their crazy people, both sides, but largely moderate, very similar languages, very similar religions. In fact, most Israelis are actually Arabs. Because most Israelis are the children and grandchildren of Jews who immigrated from Arab countries in the 50s, from Iraq, from Yemen, from North Africa, from Syria. And even today, even the, great, the, the grandchildren will say, we are Syrians, or we are Iraqis, or we are Moroccans. They, they, they take pride in their identity, just not Arabs. Just don't say Arabs. Arabs is a dirty word. But this is the reality. Now, many of you have been there, so you know it's a beautiful country with some very good people and a great deal of potential. The one missing link is equal rights. The thing that stands in the way of peace and progress for Israelis and Palestinians is equal rights, is Zionism. Zionism is the, is, is the obstacle, just like apartheid was the obstacle. And that is exactly what we need to fight for. That's exactly what we need to demand. Thank you all very much.